So we're going to talk a bit about algorithms making decisions in our lives. And how do we know that we can trust the decisions that are being made? Algorithms are making more and more decisions for us every single day. Many of them are hidden away, and we're not paying attention to them. We don't even know a lot of the time that we're already utilizing artificial intelligence. When you talk to Siri or Google Assistant, and you ask it questions, that's NLP that's understanding what it is that you're saying. And when you use Google Maps to get from point A to B through the various wildfires, uh, you're utilizing artificial intelligence in the background. We tend to no longer think of those things as they get baked into our lives as artificial intelligence. And in the future, this trend is only going to accelerate. We're going to see more and more algorithms making decisions for us. Some of those decisions are going to be trivial, and we don't really care whether they make mistakes, and some of them are going to be very serious. I noticed Google Photos the other day when I told it to look for people, uh, tagged a bunch of the paintings that I had taken in photographs all over Europe as people. Theoretically, it's not very wrong, but they aren't actually anybody that I personally know. That's a mistake that the algorithm has made. And when it makes a mistake like sending you down the wrong street, it's not necessarily the end of the world because you're still going to get to where you need to go. But when Algorithms are making decisions about who gets hired and fired, who goes to jail or who doesn't, or driving a car that could injure or kill someone. These decisions become very serious, and we need to think about how these decisions are being made and what we can do about auditing them. I'm going to give you a few examples of nightmare examples of AI gone wrong. Sometimes these are easier to see. There was a terrible example, painful example, of Google Photos labeling people of color as gorillas. Imagine if you wake up in the morning and you log in to find yourself tagged as an animal. This is an incredibly painful experience. And people don't understand how artificial intelligence works, so they might think that there's just a rogue coder who did this deliberately in your organization. This is a PR disaster, but it's also a very disastrous experience from a personal level as well. This is a painful experience for people. And sometimes life and death is at stake too. And entire business models are at stake. Uber's self-driving car killed, hit and killed a woman in Arizona last year. The sensors detected the object, the person, as an unknown object, then as a vehicle, then as a bike and it sped up. And there were a number of mistakes and assumptions within the model and within the decision-making process. They had, the National Transportation Association had discovered that in their report that they had disabled the ability of the self-driving system to emergency brake because they didn't want to see erratic behavior. They didn't want the car to make a mistake and suddenly just jam on the brakes. And so they were relying on a human a safety driver to make that split-second decision, what we call human in the loop, or HIL. That can be a very effective model, but it's not a panacea. If you guys have ever uh, used your cruise control, you have probably noticed yourself getting drowsy and paying less attention. That's actually been studied. We get something like 25 to 30 percent more drowsy. I've noticed this in my mother's car, which has adaptive cruise control with LiDAR and and radar where it speeds up and slows down, I start paying a lot less attention. So imagine that this completely autonomous vehicle has been driving for an hour or two. You have no feedback from it whatsoever that it's made a mistake, and you have to wake up out of this trance within a split second and make a decision to stop the car. It was a flawed system altogether, and it knocked Uber's ability, their program, off, the, off of public streets to this very day. Very costly mistake. Uh, and in this last example here, researchers were testing a classification system, and they tested stop signs with graffiti and stickers on them. When artificial intelligence algorithms make mistakes, they may be superhuman in their ability to make choices, They're more accurate than humans, but when they do make mistakes, they make very different mistakes than human beings. Sometimes mistakes that would be trivial. If you train a child to recognize stop signs, they're not going to mistake 
Either of those signs is anything but stop signs just because they have graffiti on them. The one on the right was detected by the visual classification system as a 45 mile an hour sign, simply because they put stickers in different locations to confuse it. These systems can be incredibly brittle, and we're going to have to deal with these in the future. But the longer term problems are subtler. They're sometimes harder to see. Sometimes we, as human beings, are very focused on the big flashy problems. It's hard to see these problems that play out over a long period of time. We spent $3 trillion since 9-11 fighting terrorism that kills less people than lightning strikes. We spend $10 billion a year on heart disease and cancer, which kills one in four men. And it's because that is a disease that plays out over a very long period of time. In terms of subtler problems, the Compass recidivism score in Florida gives a score to a judge about whether somebody should get bail, whether they're likely to commit a crime again. And it was a black box algorithm that was sold. These exist in about 18 to 19 states, and when they finally started to peel the box back on these and look at the methodologies behind them, they found that only two of them had been certified, and they'd been certified by the people who sold them to the state. And they found that they're only about 60% accurate in predicting things, and in particular cohorts, they're terrible at it. You can imagine if you put a deep learning system on the history of the American justice system, what you might find is that you're ingesting a series of injustices. And if we take a theoretical example, you might find that an algorithm that's handing out loans is not handing them out to as many women who could pay them back, because historically that was in the data set. And you might not be able to see this right away, because it's not, not giving out loans to all women, it's just giving them out to a lower percentage of ones who could actually pay it back. And these are very difficult problems to spot, and as we use more and more algorithms in life, we're going to see more and more of these become challenging. So how do we fix this? Well, one of the things that's coming down the pipe is explainable AI. There's a DARPA initiative around this called XAI where they are trying to get the machines to talk to us and tell us what it is that they're doing. But this is very cutting edge research. In 2017, there was a paper still trying to decide what explainable AI even means. Can the artificial intelligence tell us in plain language what it was doing? We're starting to see certain methods like the Lime method, which can look at a visual classification system and say, we think that these clusters of pixels were involved in the decision that the AI chose to label this as a bird or a plane. But those things are not further, they're not far enough developed for us to rely on. And even then, it's going to be a moving target. If you think about something like AlphaGo, which had four algorithms involved in it, cutting edge algorithms, if you haven't seen the documentary on Netflix, you would not think that uh, it would be riveting stuff to see a computer and human playing a game, but it's actually incredibly emotional. They're using a policy network from studying games. They had reinforcement learning, a Monte Carlo tree search, because you can't know every possible outcome, so there, because there are more possibilities than atoms in the, in the universe for moves in Go. And so you can only study little partial randomized trees in that branch. And each one of those would have to explain itself in a, in a unique way. And as we see artificial intelligence develop, we're going to see entire groups of algorithms, maybe 10 or 20 or 30, working in concert, and each one of them almost like a subroutine within the intelligence that needs to explain itself in some way. So we'll incorporate this as we go, but it's not enough. So what do most organizations do? Well, they form an ethics committee. And the ethics committee is usually some powerful people, or people who are good at politics, and people in human resources who tend to be more interested in, in these kinds of thinking than anyone else, and what they inevitably do is they get together, they talk, and they inevitably put out a report with the words inclusive and fair in it, right? If you look at the EU commission on this, their framework says it's going to be inclusive and fair and transparent, and this sounds great. Everybody feels really good about this, except none of this is actionable. These are abstract human concepts that are not translatable into models and machine code. And so what happens? Nothing. The group gets disbanded, or nothing really changes within the models because it can't. And people love these reports. Somebody just sent me a report this morning saying, I know you were giving a talk on ethics. Maybe this is useful to you. And I immediately scrolled down and saw the words, saw the words transparent, uh, inclusive, and fair <laughs> in bold letters. 
So these things are not going to be enough for us because they just sound great, uh, but they don't actually translate into anything actionable. So what we really need to do is take the middle path. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about how you would actually formulate ethics into a series of uh, statements that you could use for your data scientists. That's a totally different talk, but I am gonna talk about how we can audit these systems today already, utilizing tools and best business practices and best IT practices that we've been using for many, many years. And we're gonna talk about, we essentially don't need an ethics committee uh, or explainable AI to be able to deploy these effectively. And I'm going to talk about building what I call an AI anomaly response team, and that really consists of two teams. One is a customer public-facing team, and the other one is what I call QA for artificial intelligence. So the customer public-facing team is there to liaison with upset customers or when there's a PR disaster. This is inevitable. We have to accept the fact these systems are not perfect. They're going to make mistakes. Nothing is perfect in the world. If we could just have pure determinism, we could build perfect systems and have a perfect life. But people are going to be upset when they don't get a loan, when they're hired or fired on something, they're going to ask questions, and your answer had better be better than, that's just the way that it works. You're gonna need to train people, they're gonna need to have templates, they're gonna need to understand how these algorithms make decisions, and they're gonna be able to need to be able to talk to the public reassure the public and customers that we're on top of this, we're fixing this, we're moving forward, give them regular updates. By the way, this is actionable intelligence. Every organization on the planet should go home today and take your PR people and your customer people and start building this program. You don't need anything special to do this. It's something you're going to need to do right now if you're using algorithmic decision making in your organization. The second team is going to be something that you're going to have to build, and I expect multiple organizations to build this over time. That is a, what I call a QA for AI team. This is a group of coders, engineers, testers, data scientists who specialize in breaking artificial intelligence and finding these various edge cases. And their job is to come up with triage solutions and long-term solutions. This is gonna be a very creative team. We often talk about in artificial intelligence my God, what's gonna to happen to all the jobs? We're gonna lose them. It's very easy to see all of the jobs that we're going to lose, but it's very hard to see all the ones that we're going to create, and in fact, we always inevitably create new jobs. It's hard to explain a web designer to an 18th century farmer, because it's built on the back of 20 other technologies. Computers, the web browser, digitization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Photoshop. You can't explain all those things. So we can't see all the jobs that are coming. This is going to be a very elite team in any organization. The example of the Google Photos labeling uh, folks incorrectly. They uh, got a lot of backlash in that they, what they did is they simply stopped the system from labeling anything as a gorilla. And there's a bunch of articles in Wired and Forbes about how they didn't really fix the problem. That is correct, they did not really fix the problem. But this actually is an effective stopgap solution. It's a triage solution. When you first get to the ER, you have to stop the bleeding before you can address the deeper problem. And so that was an effective solution, it's just that they didn't go further and organizations are going to have to go further and this is where it gets more challenging. We're gonna talk a bit about how you solve the problem at a deeper level, but we're also gonna talk right now about kind of the tools. We're gonna to take the best practices that we've used in IT for a long period of time and we're gonna adapt them to artificial intelligence. We're gonna use version control in data, data and metadata management, snapshots and rollbacks to known good states, CICD pipelines, unit testing, auditing, and logging. You're gonna to have to be able to build unit tests, and we'll talk a bit about this in just a little bit, for these edge cases. These systems need to be logging their decisions over time, and you need to be able to look at a random sampling of these decisions to understand what it is that they are doing. Take that AI ethics team and have them looking at the random sampling of, of things over time. This is also where you're gonna to need to utilize tools like OpenShift, where you need that as a bedrock with containers, and you're gonna to need to be able to use things like my company's Pachyderm, where you're, which is Git for data, where you're keeping track of all of the different changes in the data and the model, the code, and how they all relate to each other so that you can go back to a known good state in the event that your fraud algorithm suddenly starts 
detecting a whole series of anomalies that are fake and has all these false positives? How do you roll backwards and forwards? We already have a lot of these systems in place, and we're going to have to adopt them and adapt them for artificial intelligence. In particular, we're going to talk about this sort of creative problem. So how would you solve a, a difficult problem like the stop signs being detected as 45 miles an hour? You're going to have to go out and potentially build, buy a new data set. And that means you're going to need integration that's much deeper than kind of CICD or what happened in containers where you were uniting storage and coding and networking and all these things together. Now you're going to need to unite the business units and, and legal teams. Think about if you need to go buy a new data set. You have to find that data set. Maybe you have to go to procurement to purchase it, or you need to involve the legal team because you need to test whether that data set is going to be effective for you. And there might be a legal agreement that's in place that says, hey, you're not allowed to use this in production until you pay for it. It's a lot of coordination that happens. Or maybe you just need to retrain a bunch of models, which means you're going to need GPU cloud time or, or on your OpenShift infrastructure. And that costs money. So again, procurement is going to have to be involved. Budgeting is going to have to be involved in these things. You're also going to have to think very creatively. This is, a, this is almost an elite special forces like T. They're going to have to come up with solutions. Maybe the triage solution is the best that you can come up with. There is no simple answer. Or maybe you've got to build a synthetic data set. Maybe you need to generate a whole series of uh, synthetic profiles of, of different women in economic models in order to be able to continually test over time whether the loans are being given out effectively. Or you're going to need to be able to develop a method that shows that that stop sign is not being detected as a 45 mile an hour sign. Right? These are test, 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 unit tests. All of these concepts, it's no longer enough to test the accuracy of a model. The self-driving car is accurate 98% of the time, but it detects a stop sign that's 45 mile an hour. That's not good enough. You're actually going to need to build a unit test for these edge cases, and this team is going to have to know how to do these things, and they're going to get more and more complex because we're always going to run into these anomalies over time. AIs will always make mistakes. The various groups that are coming out and saying these things that need to be flawless are basically asking for unicorn and fairy dust. It won't happen. We're going to have to get comfortable with algorithms making mistakes. Think about a self-driving car. Self-driving cars will likely be much better than humans at driving cars. Humans are terrible at it, by the way. 1.2 million people are killed on the roads every year, and 50 million people are injured by humans. It requires absolute perfect concentration. You, know, you drop the cell phone and start digging around for it fighting with your girlfriend, your significant other, your kids are having a bad day at school and you're not paying attention, right? The cars are going to make decisions. And there's some famous, there's a famous MIT test on, you know, which, which people get killed in the self-driving car, right? Is it the old person or the baby? You know, you make the choice. That tells us more about humans than it actually tells us about how these decisions are made by the algorithm. The algorithm, we, don't, we can't program that kind of intelligence into it. We have no idea how. They're going to make different mistakes, and we've got to build tests for them because they don't have contextual awareness. There's a famous example of a visual classification system with a baby holding a pencil, and the system labels it as a baby holding a baseball bat. Now, every human being has their sense that they know that the baseball bat would be too heavy, for the baby, it's too big to be a baseball bat, et cetera. The algorithms don't have these kind of contextual awareness, and so we're going to have to build these tests. There's even a one pixel attack that's been shown where a research organization, a research organization was able to put a single pixel, pixel into the ImageNet database at different points and able to completely destroy the system's ability to effectively detect what it was, a single pixel. So these things are going to, we're going to have to build these proper testing solutions over time to be able to know that these things are working. This is a universal problem. We're going to see artificial intelligence saturate everything. Every organization, planet, person is going to be affected by algorithmic decision making. And research in explainable AI is going to continue to accelerate, but it's not enough. We are all going to have to deal with and get better as a society with risk, and we're going to have to get better at dealing with how we communicate about these things and how we 
detect these various anomalies as they're happening. And lastly, I wouldn't be a futurist if I didn't talk a bit about what the future holds. Eventually, it's not going to be enough for just humans to do these things. We're going to have AI monitoring AI. We're going to need to automate the scaling of monitoring. And we're going to have AI in infinite regress. All of these high stakes decisions, whether it's trading money or a visual classification system for a mole on your arm. We've already, I talked about this two or three years ago. We're already starting to see companies trying to get approval to come to market. If I take a picture of this mole and it tells me that it's benign, and it turns out to be malignant, whose fault is it? The doctor could have made a mistake, but I should have maybe gotten a second opinion, but I didn't. Who is at fault for these types of things? We're going to see more and more of these types of dilemmas coming forward. Everything open, I think our, my friend Daniel likes to say that if it's not open, don't let it think for you. I like that. That's very funny. Um, it's, but we're not just going to see openness in the, uh, the tools, the infrastructure tools like TensorFlow Extended and Kubeflow and, and these things. We're going to see open data sets, open algorithms, open models. The open source methodology has absolutely, in the world, I lived through it in my wonderful days at Red Hat. I, I, when we first were going in and talking about Linux to the curmudgeonly uh, Unix engineers who said, this is going to get me fired. It can't possibly be as good as, as the proprietary Unix. That uh, looks kind of foolish nowadays. Uh, but open source will eat the artificial intelligence community as well, and it should. We want to have these synthetic data sets, open data sets, open algorithms. That's how we actually get to transparent. That's how we turn that from a platitude into something that's useful. Uh, we talked a bit about explainable AI. Contextual AI, we're going to start to see to develop in the next 10, 20, 30 years as well. And that's where these machines are able to make better decisions with a larger context. It's not a general artificial intelligence, but it has more generalized intelligence. It has more context about the decisions that it's making. If you can think about an early example of that, it might be a um, capsule network from Jeffrey Hinton. It's still research phase and not able to outperform a traditional convolutional neural network. But they taught it a bit about geometry. And if you look at a lot of the classification systems now, it can detect a face. We talked about facial recognition earlier. But if I take the eyes and I move them off the head so they're floating and the nose over here, it's still going to detect it as a face. It has no understanding that a head should go together and the eyes should be here and the lips should be here. So if we can give it more of an understanding of geometry, then we get closer to a system that has some level of common sense and understanding. So we'll continue to see the development along these fronts over the next few years. That's actually another initiative of, uh, of DARPA as well, which is uh, contextual AI. I thought I made the term up. Sometimes I make terms up, and then I find out that they're already being used widely, so I can't take credit for it, sadly. Uh, unless you want to give me credit for it, that's fine. And that is, uh, that's about it. We're all going to have to deal with these systems in the future. This is a societal level problem, and it's a problem that is, we can deal with right now, and it's going to be a moving target, but it's something that we're all going to have to focus on in the coming years if we're going to bring artificial intelligence into our organizations. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.